Our next speaker is Nurhan Suleiman, a registered dietitian nutritionist with a Bachelor of Science degree in human nutrition and foods from the University of Houston. Nurhan currently works at Texas Children's Hospital. She is committed to ongoing education and constantly seeks nutrition research to ensure that her practices are evidence-based and up-to-date. Please help me welcome Nurhan Suleiman. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me for this year's conference. Um, it's been a pleasure working with Dr. Miyaki in Houston, Texas. Today, we're going to be talking about B vitamins and a little bit beyond that uh, in terms of hydration and diet. Um, no relevant financial or non-financial relationships to disclose at this time. I wanted to start us with a true and false question just to get us warmed up before we dive into our presentation. When vitamin B2, known as riboflavin, is exposed to too much light, that can deactivate it from its usable form. Would anyone would like to take a shot and say if it's true or false? <laughs> and that is true. Um, which is why we see now milk being sold in plastic or um, carton containers rather than glass to help block the light. Oops. Okay. Um, we're going to be touching on briefly the metabolic stressors, what they are, our B vitamins, additional supplements that are pretty common in the Tango 2 world, hydration, diet, and how to handle picky eating. Um, metabolic stressors are factors that increase um, our risk of having metabolic crisis. First is fasting, whether that's for um, religious purposes, intermittent fasting, or preparing for surgery, going long hours without any food is a risk factor. Diet restrictions, whether that's um, keto diet, poor um, low-fat diet, or any type of diet that limits your macronutrients intake. Overexertion any type of activity where um, we place the body in a stressful situation, um, being in environments where there is excessive heat. Dehydration, not only in a sense where there is poor intake of fluids, but also um, fluid loss through vomiting, diarrhea, or other factors, and as well as illnesses and infection. Moving on to B vitamins. We've heard so much so far about why they're so important. I'm not gonna go over that again. As we see in the natural history study, we've, we've found a very positive link between that and preventing metabolic crisis. According to the study, out of 25 children who have had no metabolic crisis, 19 of them were on some sort of B vitamin or a multivitamin. The earlier we start on these um, B vitamins, the better outcome in terms of neuro their neurological um, status. Now, how soon can you see improvement once you start on these B vitamins? That is going to vary from person to person. And as Dr. Miyaki mentioned, even though um, these benefits of B vitamins are very positive, they're not considered a cure, which is further research still needed. B complex is a supplement that will hold the majority of B vitamins. It doesn't always include all of our B vitamins. Um, and they're essential because they're coenzymes that can help release macro energy from our macronutrients that include protein, carbs, and, um, and fats, breaking down proteins, forming red blood so cells, and synthesizing DNA. B vitamins are water soluble, which means any access in our body is going to be flushed out rather than stored, which is why it's very important that we have a continuous intake of B vitamin through our diet or supplementing. Don't feel limited to only one form of B vitamin. There's many forms out there like liquid, tablet, capsules, gummies, and powders. You might see on the shelf that there's a B50 complex and a B100 complex. Those are high potency um, adult formulas. Basically, B50 means there's 50 milligram of each of the B complex vitamins, and B100, that means there's 100 milligram of each of the B vitamins. 
They can be so different, our B-complex um, vitamins, I mean supplements, sorry, so much so that even within the same brand, we're still going to see differences. For example, here we have Nature's Bounty brand. On the left-hand side, you see a liquid form. On the left hand, right-hand side, you see a tablet form. In the liquid form, you can, um, as you see on the nutrition label, there's only five out of the eight B vitamins. It's missing thiamine, B1, biotin, B7, and folate, B9. On the right-hand side, it includes all B vitamins. As well as, if you can see, um, for B12, it only holds 1,200 mcg under one ml, versus the one tablet on the right-hand side holds 250 mcg of B12. So even though, vi even though a brand can have multiple forms um, of a B vitamin, that doesn't necessarily it will include all of them or the same amount of each B vitamin. Which brings up the next question that Dr. Miyake touched on is how much should my child take? So far, the exact dosage remains unknown, but what we know is that at least it should meet the RDA, which stands for Recommended Daily Allowance. As you see here on the chart, that amount for each B vitamin is going to change as your child gets older. And at one point, it's going to be um, not just age, but also sex specific. So if your child currently is on a B vitamin that it's meeting their needs for their current age right now, be mindful that as they get older, you want to be, um, you want to check the label and see if that's still meeting their um, age as they get older. Now we're going to talk about each B vitamin in a little bit more details. Our first B vitamin is thiamine. It plays a vital role in the growth basic cell functions, and breaking down nutrients for energy. You can find thiamine in pork, fortified and rich grains, beans, lentils, peas, sunflower seeds. There's only a small amount that's stored in the liver, so it's very important that we have continuous intake of thiamine in our diet. Next is B2, ripoflavin. Um, it's the coenzymes that involve the cell's growth, energy production as well, the breakdown of fats and medication. It also has um, a role in protecting our thyroid from any oxidative stress. We can find B2 in dairy, eggs, beef, organ meats like beef liver, salmon, fortified and rich grains, and spinach. B3 is niacin. It's a coenzyme that's utilized by over 400 enzymes for many reactions, including energy production as well, as we can see that's a common theme across our B vitamins, creating and repairing DNA, and as well having an antioxidant effect. We can find it in red meat, poultry, fish, fortified and rich grains, nuts, and bananas. I mentioned earlier that any excess of B vitamins will be flushed out of our body and not stored. For B3, um, having high levels of that vitamin in our body can cause toxicity. It will present and um, it will present as skin flushing, rapid heartbeat, um, nausea, and diarrhea. B5 is pentothenic acid. As we've learned today that it makes the coenzyme CoA, which is a chemical compound that helps enzymes build and break down fatty acids, as well as other metabolic functions. We find it in beef, chicken, organ meats, beef, um, sorry, fortified and rich grains, avocado, broccoli, and mushrooms. B6, known as pyridoxine, it's as well a coenzyme that as well breaks down our macronutrients, maintain normal levels of homocysteine, which is an amino acid that can be harmful to our body in high levels, as well as supporting our immune function and brain health. We find it in beef liver, tuna, salmon, fortified and rich grains, chickpeas, dark leafy greens, papayas, oranges, and cantaloupe. Just like B3, which is niacin, B6, pyridoxine, can also be toxic to our body um, in high levels, leading to um, impaired walking. 
B7, known as biotin, that's our glamorized vitamin that we hear so much about for nair, I mean, sorry, hair, <laughs> nails, and skin growth. Um, it assists enzymes in breaking down macronutrients. It also helps signals sent by our cells as well as the activity of our genes. You can find it in pork, beef liver, cooked eggs, salmon, fortified and rich grains, avocados, sweet potatoes, nuts, and seeds. Next is B9, known as folate, or you might hear, hear it known as folic acid. It helps form DNA and RNA. It also is involved in protein metabolism, breaking down homocysteine, producing he um, healthy red blood cells, as well as being critical during periods of rapid growth, for example, during pregnancy. You can find it in eggs, fortified and rich grains, dark leafy greens, beans, peanuts, and sunflower seeds. Just to note here that higher in high intake of B9 can mask a deficiency of B12. So you might see normal levels of B12, but that could be due to a mask of B9. And lastly is B12, known as cobalamin. It also plays a viral role in forming forming red blood cells and DNA. It's also vital for our brain development and nerve cells. You can find it in fish, shellfish, beef liver, red meat, eggs, poultry, dairy, fortified nutritional yeast, fortified and enriched grains, and enriched soy. As you see on the food sources, the majority is animal proteins. Um, which is why people who are on a vegan diet can um, develop B12 deficiency. Next is additional supplements that are pretty common in the Tango 2 world. I get a lot of questions from families. Um, what do you think about the Mito cocktail? What are your thoughts on it? Do you recommend it? First, we have to understand what a Mito cocktail is. It's basically a cocktail of different supplements, including vitamins, antioxidants, um, and, and, and antioxidants that are used to support the mitochondrial um, function. It's commonly used by medical teams as a line of treatment for um, mitochondrial diseases. Common components that we see in the Miro cocktail is B vitamins, CoQ10, L-carnitine, vitamin E, alpha-lipoic acid, and creatine. Now the question is, how could that relate to um, Tango 2 deficiency disorder? As we know, that deficiency um, can affect the cell on a mitochondrial level. But because the exact, um, the exact role of the gene remains unknown, um, it's hard to kind of tell what is the exact benefit of these additional supplement for people with Tango 2 deficiency disorder. If you are interested in discussing the Mito cocktail, cocktail or looking more into it, please make sure you, you consult the medical, medical team prior to that because each of these supplements have to be tailored individually to each person's needs. Next is coenzyme Q10, known as CoQ10. It's vital for energy production in the form of ATP. It also has an antioxidant protection by eliminating free radicals in our system, as well as other cellular functions. It's mainly used in the cardiovascular and fertility research, um, but because we still don't yet know its exact benefit for people with Tango 2 deficiency, there is still a limited, limited research. If you are interested in increasing the intake of coenzyme Q10, one way is through diet. You can increase intake of whole grains, organ meats, fatty fish, soybeans, nuts, and seeds. Keep in mind that coenzyme Q10 is fat soluble. So if you um, have a child or know someone who's on that supplement, taking it with a meal that's high in fats will increase its absorption. Coenzyme Q10 may interact with blood thinners like warfarin, uh, making it less effective. Next is levocarnitine, known as L-carnitine. It's an amino acid that is considered a, co considered a cofactor that is naturally synthesized in, the, in our brain, kidneys, and liver. It helps transport long-chain fatty acid out of the, into the mitochondria to produce energy. It also helps transport out of the mitochondria um, any toxic compounds. 
if you're interested in increasing carnitine through diet, that naturally presents in all food, but mainly foods of animal origin. Again, if you're interested in looking more into the supplement form, please make sure you consult the medical team prior. Our last supplement for the day that we're gonna touch on is multivitamins. I get a lot of questions from parents that should I just do the B-complex or should I do the multivitamin since it has the B-complex and other vitamins. The thing is with multivitamins, it doesn't not necessarily always include all eight B vitamins, but it will typically include vitamin A, D, E, and K. Those are fat soluble vitamins that can be toxic in high levels. So it's very um, important that we follow the doses as instructed on the nutrition label. If you happen to find a multivitamin that best works for your child, but they're not being very cooperative with, for um, taking it, you can try other methods. Um, if it's a capsule, you might want to poke a hole, squeeze that gel, and mix it with some snacks. I've seen that the best snacks that have the most success with hiding the texture and the flavor is pudding and um, applesauce. All right, same as B-complex, so we've touched on earlier, multivitamins can be also very different even within the same brand. Here we have an example of Flintstone. It's a pretty common brand that I see families use. On the left-hand side, in the gummies form, the, um, the label only includes five out of the eight B vitamins. On the left-hand side, it, the tablet form includes all eight B vitamins. You can also see that the amount varies between gummies forms and a tablet form, and the dosage also also varies depending on the age. So it's very important that we just don't assume that just because it's a multivitamin or a B-complex that it's going to include everything, it's always important to review prior to purchase. With all these supplements being touched on, um, unfortunately, they are not regulated through the FDA. So how can we know that what's written on the label, it's what's, ex it's what's exactly um, in the supplement bottle. One way is through third-party verifications. NSF, USB, and Consumer Labs are one of the top companies in the US that verify um, supplements. One way you can check is just by basically looking for these logos on the supplement label. SGS, ALS are global companies, and Bureau of Varitis are France-based. These are some common verified brands that you can find over the shelf in our um, pharmacies. It does not include all of them, but those are the most common ones I've seen. <laughs> Moving on to hydration. Why is hydration important regardless of the health status? Cell dehydration can lead to um, severe effects on our muscles, including catabolism, which is the breakdown of our muscles. It can also lead to anabolic resistance, which is our body resisting to build muscle, as well as muscle wasting. Dehydration is not only a result of poor intake of fluids, it can be a result, for, it can be a result of water loss due to being in environments where there's excessive heat, exercise, burns, vomiting, diarrhea, and as well being on medications like laxatives and diuretics, as well as having medical conditions like kidney problems and hyperglycemia. When dehydrated or suspecting dehydration, please make sure to limit intake of caffeine as that further increases um, dehydration. Caffeine can be found in coffee, teas, and sodas. Dehydration can look different from a child to a baby. With a child, you will notice that their skin is pretty inelastic, and you might see some dryness around their lips and tongue. For a baby, you will notice their soft spot on their forehead is pretty sunken, as well as that when, when they cry, there's few to no tears. Um, I put this slide together, just a reminder that water is not only the only source of hydration. You can try, if your child's being pretty picky, you can try through other ways, like Pedialyte juices, or even fruits and vegetables that have high water, 
water content or other snacks like popsicles and smoothies. Moving on to diet. Why is having a complete balanced diet so important for our Tango 2 peop um, people? Tango 2 deficiency disorder can cause poor intake of nutrients. It can also lead to decrease in appetite, as well as having dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing. So poor intake of nutrients eventually leads to malnutrition, and malnutrition is a risk factor of metabolic crisis. So what do we not recommend? We do not recommend fasting, and we do not recommend food restrictions um, like keto diet or following any diet that limits your macronutrients intake, which is protein, fats, and carbs. And please do not restrict any fat in kids that are two years and under, as fat is very important for their brain development. What we recommend is a balanced diet of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and frequent snacking. Snacking should be given around every two to three hours. We highly recommend a bedtime snack that's high in protein and fats, as protein and fats um, provide the most satiety and will hold them over until morning. With that being the case, there's no need for a midnight snack or waking, up during, waking them up during sleep for a snack unless hypoglycemia is a problem. Other forms of snacking that you can try to look into is nutritional drinks like Pediasure, Boost Kids, or you can even use these drinks as a base for smoothies. Moving on to picky eating. And I think that's the family's favorite topic. <laughs> Feeding does not only include our taste sensory, it includes all of our sensory systems. That's touch, sound, smell, sight, and taste. Children become picky during their early childhood years. That's from age one to five. As they get older, they tend to grow out of that temporary phase and expand their selection of food. So no need to panic. What can we do at home to help with that? Try to stick to a schedule. Um, if you give order for, uh, if you give your child order to their meals, that will give them a sense of that their meals is not necessarily a choice, but part of th their day-to-day -day activities. Try to limit distractions when they're on the table. I have families that tell me if I don't have something on the TV or on a tablet, then my child won't eat. If your child falls under if your child happens to only eat more when they're kind of distracted, that, that's fine. But if you feel like distraction is a problem for them, try to limit that. <clears throat> Practice food chaining, which is a concept I'll touch on in the next slide. Involve your kid in meal preparation. Make it fun for them. Have them be in the kitchen with you when you prepare their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, Engage, engage them in that process. Ask them to kind of hand you the ingredients. Make them feel like when they're about to eat their meal, it's something that they created for themselves. Offer them choices, but not too many. When you want to introduce a new vegetable or a fruit or whatever that food is, um, don't introduce it, but rather give them choices. Tell them, okay, for dinner, we're going to have two to three. You have these choices of two to three vegetables. Which one would you like to have? Try to limit choices only two to three because giving them more than that can be overwhelming for a child. One way you can try to do, um, try to help with picky eating is combine a new food with their favorite food. It will kind of, it will make the new food look less scary. Um, have everyone on the table eat the same thing. Don't make your child feel they're left out or they're the only ones who's going to eat the vegetable or the fruit, especially their siblings. If they see their siblings eating the same thing as them, they'll feel more encouraged. As well as be patient with them and applaud the small steps that they make, as small as them just tasting the food or smelling the food or even playing with the food. It's going to take about 20 plus times of introducing a new food to your child for your child to be willing to try it. Food chaining is a method where um, you take their favorite food and then you start making small changes through texture, taste, um, temperature, and color until you eventually reach to the final goal, which is the new food that you want to introduce. For example, here we have 
um, goldfish. You can try that cheesy flavor through new shapes. Once they get comfortable with that and you feel like your child is more willing to try that new shape, then you can make a new change by maybe a slight texture change. And then that process continues eventually until you get to your final goal, which is broccoli and melted cheese. It's a long process that does not take one or two weeks. It takes over months. If your child is picky with vegetables, um, you can try to sneak it through their meals like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For example, here, maybe you can blend cook cooked cauliflower into mashed potatoes. You can try to sneak in celery and onions into meatloaf. Um, just some ways to help out with their picky eating behavior. If your child falls under the picky with protein and you're interested in having a protein supplement, first make sure you consult with the medical team to get the green light to go ahead and get a protein supplement. If you would like to make your own purchase of protein supplement, make sure that is verified under a third party. Other sources of protein can be cheeses like cream cheese, cottage cheese, yogurt, eggs, soybean, tofu, chickpeas like hummus lentils, peanut butter, or nuts. So it's not only limited to animal protein. You can also try high protein brands like Kodiak and Banza. Those brands will offer um, carb food that has a higher amount of carbs, I mean, sorry, higher amount of protein. Picky eating is a very, very dynamic topic that we can talk about for hours. So if you're interested in more resources and information about how to handle picky eating, those two books, um, let me see, Secrets of Feeding a Healthy Family by Ellen Satter and Food Chaining are very great sources to learn more about that. Um, in conclusion, our goals from a nutrition standpoint is to have adequate intake of B vitamins, maintaining hydration, and having balanced nutritious diet. And that's all I have for you. Thank you. Okay.